have to uh, thank the organizer for the invitation. Actually, I'm one of the organizers. <laughs> <laughs> the problem is that I was uh, inviting Chris Mason, who's a famous scientist at uh, Cornell University in New York. And uh, he's doing very fancy stuff like the Urbanome, sending summer students in the subway to collect samples and roll themselves on the floor and try to see you know, the effect of the microbiome. Um, Washington Post, New York Times, you know, pretty cool stuff. And recently he had a, a big project with NASA where they had, a, 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 they had twins and they looked at the epigenetics of the twin on Earth and the twin on the International Space Station. So if you think your research is cool, this <laughs> medicine is definitely cooler. Um, so he told me he could not come. And uh, I guess he was going uh, for a ride. So I uh, guess Chris. <laughs> Um, doing some reproducibility research in space. Um, I'm a little bit down to earth, so I'm going to talk about risk with the reproducibility on Earth. Um, but I guess that's still an important topic, right? Okay, so uh, today I'll talk about drug classification. So um, you'll see a lot of photos of people in the lab who participated to that big study. Uh, and the idea is the following. So I'm going to call drug any small molecules, any compounds that have been used to test um, their inhibitory effect on uh, cancer models. So it's a very, very broad definition. Um, and the point here is that we are wondering how to best classify those drugs. Uh, many drugs have off-target effect. Their, their mechanism of action is fully characterized. But they still do something to those cancer cells that seem to be interesting. Not, not all cancer cells die, only a subset, and that means that there might be a relationship between the genomics or the molecular states of those cells and the drug mechanism of action. So as you can as you can see already, it seems to be quite an important topic related to precision medicine. If you better understand what a drug is doing, you might be better. Uh, you might you might be able to use it um, uh, better to treat the patients. So another question is that we've got tons of data about those drugs, but can we integrate all this information to get better drug taxonomy or drug classification? So by the way, interrupt me during the talk. I prefer to have a conversation rather than a lecture. So if you have any question, interrupt me. Um, one of the very common data layer we use to understand whether drugs are similar or not is just based on chemical structure. You can easily guess that if two drugs have very, very similar structures, they might be doing the same thing. Uh, sometimes it doesn't work. Sometimes just the fact that a molecule is the mirror of another one um, drives a different, uh, little to a different mechanism of action. But many times this is true. So people have been preparing drug structure for ages, and the way they do it is that they take a complex structure, complex structure they um, divide that structure into pharmacophores, small subset of, of the chemical structure, and then they look at how many are in common, how many are not. So it's a very crude approach, but it seems to work decently well in, in, for many applications. And it's called the Telemoto Index. It's basically a jacket index on the, pharma, on the union and intersection of the pharmacophore. And this is not what my lab has been is doing. Um, do you have a question on that? No, you're good. Okay. Um, my lab is more interested in big data. Uh, so we have been analyzing gene expression, uh, uh, microarrays, and RNA-seq for ages. Uh, and recently, we decided to focus on pharmacogenics, where we try to understand the relationship between omics data and the drug response, and especially in some mice. That's where we got most of the data. And that's, that's actually a slide showing how, over the years, pharmacogenics data have been, uh, have been shared. So it all started with the uh, NCI 60 panel used by the Development Therapeutics Program uh, at the NCI. That's like early 90s, actually late 90s, and they, they spread like 200,000 compounds. It's pretty insane. Um, but they basically created a service where you send your compound and they're going to screen it for you. So they got a, an amazing amount of data, but it's only 67, it's a small panel. And then Japan tried to do the same. And then there is the famous connectivity map data set that Ali uh, briefly uh, discussed. Uh, I'll show you a little bit more about the design of that data set. But they treated uh, a thousand cell lines, uh, a thousand <laughs> drugs for uh, three cell lines. It's still not big. 
And then you see all companies as well as big institute like the Broad Institute or Sanger Institute basically increase the number of semis that were screening, increase the number of drugs to get a better uh, data set to actually understand the relationship between molecular features and drug response. And the idea behind all those data sets is to build biomarkers. So if you understand that, let's say if these genes amplify the sunlight respond better to the drug, you could basically translate that information in clinical settings where a patient comes, you see the amplification, and you treat the patient with that. Right? That's the dream. This is not what we are going to talk to. Uh, I'm going to talk uh, to you about. Um, about today, this is just a source of information we're going to use. So, a bunch of talented people in the lab, um, including uh, Peter Smirnov and Lavin, are you presented, Rene, uh, Victor, Mark Freeman, um, and many others actually try to create all those data sets and build new processing pipeline to really be able to leverage this massive amount of data. Not just, not just one data set at a time, but multiple data sets. So we built the PharmaProjects platform, which is an R package where you can easily download all those, all those data sets. The drug names have been created, the, the summary name has been created, all the molecular data have been reprocessed. And to make it even easier for clinicians and biologists to access this data, even for us in a way, we don't always want to load the R package. Uh, we build a web application called PharmaQLB that I will uh, briefly introduce uh, in the next couple of slides. Um, but we also, not only we have a web app in our package, we also have uh, Docker instances that you can easily load and uh, play with. So the, end, the entry bar is very low. Uh, we can use it for many things, biomarker discovery, drug combination, uh, creation of drug synergy. Uh, here I'm going to talk about drug classification. And that's a paper that um, Neme Lashem Dinagendu and uh, Lale Sultan Garai um, published uh, last year. And uh, Alex um, Adam uh, on the right is working on an update. I will present some new results today. OK, so the first type of data I would like to discuss, um, in addition to the drug structure, we're we also looking at what we call drug-induced transcriptome perturbation. And that's exactly what the connectivity the connectivity map is doing, and they have a new generation of the connectivity map called the L1000. So what, what they've done basically is to invent a new chip that can um, measure the expression of 1,000 genes uh, that cost only five bucks. So that makes it easy to actually generate very uh, large data sets. The problem now is that even so you can screen more drugs, it's only 1,000 genes. That has been published probably uh, three or four months ago uh, in Cell. And you can see that they have a lot of data, more than a million uh, gene expression profiles. So, what it does, it, ba it basically takes cell lines that are untreated, then they treat those cell lines with drugs, and they look at the gene expression changes. Uh, so, don't expect the target of the drug to be down. Here, this is mRNA. So, what you're going to see is a downstream effect of the drug. But by comparing the, the baseline versus the, the treated uh, cell lines, you can actually understand what are the, gene, the genes that are over, up, or down regulated uh, by the drug. And this is like short term treatment, it's only 6 or 12 hours. Uh, otherwise, if the drug is killing the cells, you may catch a signal that just about does it. That's not really drug specific. So it's like very early effect of the drugs. So what we've done is that we computed those signatures. You do like very simple. Um, differential to expression, the only tricky part is that there are, like, there are almost 4,000 batches in the data, so it's not really the usual data set, we're talking about 1.8 million experiment with 4,000 batches, you can imagine that batch effects is a huge problem here, so you have to control for that. So we build those gene expression uh, uh, drug perturbation signatures, as we call them, and we got one signature per drug, and then when you compare those two drugs, the, the perturbation signature of those two drugs, you understand whether they perturb the same genes the same way. Um, and if not, they're very different. Otherwise, you assume that they're doing something similar. So the, the third type of data, so we had drug structure, we had drug perturbation, now we're going to talk about drug sensitivity. And what those data sets are, are, are measuring, actually, so that it's more than two data sets, there is a long trail of data sets doing that, long trail of studies. 
is actually looking at the effect of the drug on cell viability. And I'll show you, I'll show you very briefly what PharmacoDB is doing, so you can actually mine all those data sets very easily. So if you go on pharmacodb.pmgenomics.ca, you can enter several types of information. You can put a cell line in and try to see what are the drugs that have been tested on that cell line or in, in which data set. A drug name, same thing, how many cell lines have been tested with that drug. You can put a tissue type, you know, give me all the cell lines that are breast that have been tested with drugs, for instance, and you can specify a cell line name and a, a drug name, and then it will give you what we call the drug dose response here. Uh, I'll give you a few examples here. So this is when you type MCF7, the name of Salon, uh, in the presence of Salon. And you can see that that Salon has been, has been tested like with 400 drugs in, in that data set, GRPV2. And, and you can see that it's been tested in, in, in lower, fewer cell, cell lines in other data set, but you get all this information on one page. Here, uh, AZD6244 is a drug that's actually called um, which is interesting again, uh, you see AZD6244 for computer, it's not obvious that this also means silimetinib. So there's a lot of curation behind the scene to make that happen. But that drug has been tested in many data sets again on many cell lines. And this is what we call the drug growth response curve. So on the x axis, you have the drug concentration in dog scale. And on the y axis, you have cell viability. So at the beginning, you're with zero concentration, you get 100% cell viability. That's normalized against the control. Um, then you start treating the, the cells with different concentration. Actually, you don't start. You have several experiments in parallel. In parallel, you test different concentration, and you see, compared to the control, how fast your cells grow. Uh, are they inhibited? Is it cytostatic cyto or cytotoxic? So here, you can see, for instance, that for the cell lines A549, I think so I'm going to cell lines, we treat it with selimetinib. You can see that the data set kind of disagree with each other. So in that data set, this cell line is extremely resistant until that concentration where suddenly you get this great uh, inhibitory effect. While in that data set, um, uh, GDC1000, actually you got two replicates that they completely dis disagree, which is always fun. Um, and then you get CCLE that's right in the middle. It says that there is some inhibitory effect that's much more progressive. You get some inhibitory effect at low concentration. So that's an example where basically data set kind of disagree. There are many examples where they agree. It's always uh, funnier to show when it doesn't work, especially when you don't share the data. I didn't spend the money, so I don't care. Um, and from those curves, what you can do is to actually generate a lot of statistics. Um, Ali talked about the IC50, which is the concentration you need to kill 50% of the cell lines, to inhibit 50% of, of the cell. Um, you can look at many other metrics. Uh, uh, metrics. What the one we're going to do here is called AAC, is the area above the curve, which means that uh, if it's high, it means that the cells got killed very quickly. Uh, if it's slow, it means that uh, if it's low, close to zero, it means that the cell lines are very resistant. They don't really care uh, about that drug treatment. Um, and in the paper we published in Cancer Research, we actually looked only at two data sets, NCI60, because they had a lot of drugs, but it's only a very small panel of cell on safety. Um, while we use CTRPV2, who has much less drugs, 500, but they also have much bigger panel of cell lines, up to almost a thousand cell lines. And what Alex is doing right now is try to see whether we can combine all those data sets to do something more like a meta-analysis. And what happens is that you can compute relationship between drugs. Um, let's say you can take the vector of a drug uh, sensitivity um, in CTRPV2 and compare it to a drug in CCLA. The big issue, though, is that now you get the same drugs in both data sets, and you compute a correlation, and guess what? It's not one because there is a lot of noise in those data. So as I showed, the drug dose response are quite different. So now we are a little bit facing issues where the diagonal is supposed to be one, but it's not. And sometimes you get a higher number for another drug pair, which doesn't make sense. So we have to do a little bit of uh, uh, hacking behind the scene. So that's uh, something we're working on. But the beauty now is that if you combine all those um, data sets, you can really increase the number of signs and the number of drugs that you that you put in your, uh, uh, in your method already um, um, 
talked about this, but for a given drug, you get all those drug goals response curves. So now you have a vector for each sign, you have a AAC, an area above the curve, and two drugs would be similar if they kill the same sunlight. And two drugs would be dissimilar if they kill very different so It's a similar idea than, uh, than the uh, drug perturbation signature. So again, we, we use simple Pearson correlation to build that drug drug similarity. And Alex is investigating a new type of data set. It's called the cell painting data set. So what it is, the Broad Institute, as usual, they are the only ones who can uh, afford to do very, very large scale experiment. Uh, so, what they've done is to do exactly like the CMAP. They, um, they have microscopic images of, uh, microscopy based images of the cells uh, before and after treatment. And they're trying to understand what it changes from a phenotypic perspective, point of view. It, are the cells going smaller or bigger? Do they change shape? Um, do they interact, do they cluster? Um, so that sounds like a very interesting type of data. Uh, there are 30,000 compounds, five, in, 5 million images. The only problem is that for the moment the data are being summarized with like 800 features that are very, very crude way of analyzing uh, images, especially in that deep learning era. Uh, so we are now investigating whether we can uh, download those images and do more sophisticated image analysis. But again, uh, we, we took their 800 features, look at correlation, so if two drugs seem to have the same imaging features, they're similar otherwise. They do something different. So something about big data is that everybody is talking about big data. Uh, and you take many big data, and then the overlap is very small. Uh, that's very common in practice. Uh, if you talk to people, they, only, they always have big data, and then when you start really uh, be picky about the quality of the data or the subset of the data you want, it becomes very, very small quickly. So here, as you can see, if you want, the structure is no big deal. We have structure for all the drugs. But if you look at drugs for which we have sensitivity, uh, perturbation, and imaging data, even though you start with thousands of thousands of them, you only have 85 in common. And uh, you'll see why I, I'm going to focus, I'm going to ignore some painting and just look at this overlap. <laughs> and out of those 280 drugs, we actually have annotated drug target for almost all of them, not all. And ATC classes, which are anatomical therapeutic specification, if I'm not mistaken, which basically says, okay, we, we, we looked at your drug in the clinic, it's doing this, it has this um, toxic effect, so we put it in a category. Uh, it could be a drug for diabetes or a drug for uh, cardiovascular diseases. Anyway, we have those classes for drugs. And as you can imagine, this is great for us as a benchmark. If we try to classify the drugs and we don't recapitulate, if we don't put to get close to each other drugs that have the same targets so or the same ATC, we're in trouble. We are doing something that goes against the uh, uh, external uh, observation regarding those drugs. So when we built those drug-drug similarities, um, we first looked at the uh, each layer separately. And, and you can already see a big, big issue here. If you look at imaging, all the drugs are doing exactly the same thing. There is absolutely no discrimination. You look at those 800 features and they are, they are super highly correlated. And the problem could be that they only looked at one cell line. So imagine if that cell line is resistant to, to the majority of those 30,000 drugs. There is absolutely no signal in the data. So it's really a pity. I wish they had done like 2,000 drugs on at least five cell lines, so we could, see, we could see some heterogeneity in the data. But for the moment, that's not the case, so that's why we're going to ignore that data for now. Yeah? When you're calculating the correlation for the images, are you um, calculating on the feature space or are you using your dimensions? So for the moment, we took the whole feature space. The good point is that we should probably kill most of those features because they're very constant across the whole data set, but we don't optimize that yet. Uh, are the rows lined up across these four? Uh, no, they are clustered separate. Okay. So it's a little bit hard to really see the different effects. But I'll show more plus about how those matrices are actually correlated. They, they may actually cluster all the drugs the same way or not. So we will investigate that data. And weirdly enough, the structure, they have mostly negative correlation. We're also investigating that bias. Uh, but at least you see some structure in, in the cluster. <coughs> And 
And here we are using, so now we have drug drug similarities for each layer of subprotein. But that was not the most exciting part. I mean, people have done that for ages, one data at a time, uh, at a time uh, mostly with drug structure. So what we wanted to do is to use a method that uh, Anna Goldenberg's lab um, published um, in 2014, which really allows to uh, fuse different layers in a smart way. So what the similarity network fusion is doing is really to take a local perspective of how you should fuse the different data types. So if you have, uh, it takes into account the whole similarity around a given drug to actually, to actually fuse the different layers and see whether several layers agree with each other and therefore uh, you make it a stronger similarity, otherwise uh, you kill it. But it, it does it in a regular way, which is pretty convenient for us. So what we've done is we took those three matrices we use SNF to have a fused matrix, and I'll show the fused matrix in a, in a moment. Here's the fused matrix, and you can see that there is a lot more, small, lot more smaller clusters now along the diagonal. So that means that somehow the fusion is doing a better job at creating those small clusters of drugs. And now we're going to look at what are those clusters of drugs. <coughs> As expected, if you look at the correlation between matrices, they could have all classify the drugs the same way, but that was not the case. If you look at the Spearman correlation, you see two matrices, you just uh, do Spearman correlation on, you factorize them, and you compute the correlation. There is very little correlation, except maybe between sensitivity and perturbation. It looks like you classify more or less the drugs the same way, or the similarities are not that, that different, but correlation is still extremely low. If you fuse those, um, those layers, you get a consensus layer. And as expected, that consensus layer is much more correlated to every single data type. You kind of find a trade-off between all those um, those drug drug similarities. So okay, it does what we wanted it to do. Now we need to to see whether this new classification is better than than any single layer classification. So we had 280 drugs. Um, we run so we have a drug similarity matrix with 280 drugs. We um, truncated a lot of the similarities that were too weak. So now we got this network, and we run a community detection uh, algorithm, so we use affinity propagation. So what it does is just try to find sub-networks that are extremely tightly connected with each other, where the similarity is extremely high. Um, and each um, cluster is being represented by one drug in that cluster that's supposed to be representative. So we use the um, cytoscape here to display that networks of representative drugs. Uh, so instead of 280, you see only 50 communities, 51 communities here. And I'll show a few examples um, to hopefully convince you that that network actually makes sense. So we were looking for positive control. So we know a few things about drugs. So for instance, HDAC inhibitors, we knew that they were supposed to act the same way. If they share the same target, they're supposed to act the same way. So we would like to see whether we can find non examples. So as I said, HDAC inhibitors are now to, to have very, very uh, conserved mechanism of action, uh, action across uh, multiple compounds. So it was no surprise that all the HDAC inhibitors in our data set were closer together. Again, uh, good to see. Um, they had very similar perturbation and sensitivity signature, but interestingly, their structure vary a lot. So that's something you would have missed if you use the um, if you use only the chemical structure to cluster the drugs. Here is like the most boring example ever because the structure are very similar. Um, so we got all the BRF inhibitors clustering together. So again, uh, a good example, a good positive control for us. And then it started to, to get a bit more interesting. So we looked at the statins, uh, to our uh, lower um, cholesterol lowering drugs. Um, and all the statins clustered together, so that was a good sign. However, we found that compound, Fafenolid, that was clustered very tightly with the statin, which doesn't make any sense. Um, it's not known to be to act on cholesterol at all. And as usual, when you go on the web and you have a hypothesis, you always find at least one paper. Uh, we call it biopoetry in the lab. It's a, it's a very unscientific way to prove your point. Um, so we found a paper that remotely connect that drug to cholesterol. Okay. Great, uh, probably wrong, but interesting nonetheless. 
Um, this is a bit more interesting stuff. So we got all the AGFR and PRBV2 uh, inhibitors clustered together, and there is a bunch of them, so, so that was a, a good positive control. But uh, there was the Britain kinase inhibitors clustered with all the AGFR. And that evidence is a little bit stronger. So they actually found that um, uh, the Britain kinase inhibitor could be used for uh, EGFR mutated uh, tumor. So th there is like a, a clinical observation that this drug is actually relevant for that type of disease. So I think that's an example of, let's say, drug repurposing. Um, if, you did, if you didn't have this paper, we could have predicted that, hey, that drug should be used on the same kind of patient. So we also had the, all the microtubules inhibitors clustered together. So those are uh, chemotherapy with a, a broad uh, inhibitory effect. And again, we found that this drug, which was not annotated at all to be a microtubule inhibitor, seems to have a, a serum against mycin that's uh, reported in that paper. So as I said, this is a lot of bioforging. You, know, you, look, you look at PubMed and you always find something. Uh, if you really want to convince yourself that your method is any good, instead of doing manual uh, search and, and very biased observations, like a version of cherry picking, basically, uh, what you need to do is to look at the whole network and see whether there is very general relationships between the drugs. So what we've done is to actually look at whether two drugs um, with the same target would get a, a much smaller similarity than drugs with different targets. And you can do it for all the layers, for each layer separately. And those are the color um, curves. Uh, so the green is stricter, the font size is a little bit small. So uh, red is stricter, uh, for drug similarity is based on chemical structure. Structure um, green is based on sensitivity, whether they kill the same cell line or not. Blue is based on perturbation, do they up and down regulate, it, regulate the genes the same way. And black is the fusion. Um, and, and honestly, uh, we were expecting better results, but we were not expecting such a nice uh, uh, improvement uh, due to the fusion of the gene. So that really means that methods based on a single data type really have only part of, of, of the story. Um, and they, they cannot really understand what the mechanism of action is until, or at least look at drug similarities until you fuse the layers. So, and that is also true for ATC, for the anatomical uh, therapeutics classification. So we are able to put together drugs that have to, that seem to have the same indication uh, uh, for clinical use. So that's where kind of the cancer research paper stops. Um, I already presented ways where we can combine more data set to have more drugs. Um, but here we wanted to go a little bit further and really, and basically really achieve what we wanted to do, which is infer a potential mechanism of action for a new compound. So let's say you take, the you take a molecule from a tree and you test it on the cell lines and it seems to have some, some effects on, on those cancer cell lines, but you know nothing about that compound. You may know the structure because that's not that difficult to, to uh, reverse engineer, but you, you know nothing else about the mechanism of action. And chemoinformatics doesn't really help you much here. So you decide to say, you decide to do some additional experiments and then upload those data on, on, on the cell server and it will project your drug into that big network and tell you what are the neighbors and what are the potential targets. So what we wanted to have is a tool where you could, you could generate data without knowing what the drug is doing. So what you can do is uh, treat cell lines and see which one got killed, which one uh, were resistant, and then look at gene expression before and after. So those are very relatively easy experiments to do. So here's the user uploading the different uh, drugs. Then we project that drug in the network based on the similarities to all the other drugs. And each edge is basically um, the is weighted by the similarity. And what you can do now, because you know targets for 225 of those drugs out of 280, you can start to see whether there is some consensus in the neighbors. Uh, if your drug is doing something completely crazy, it's going to be outside the community at the edge of the network. And that's great news. It means you found a compound that's doing something completely new. So we call it first in test. But most of the time, your compound is going to be close, close to another set of compounds. Drugs. So here you can see 
that um, you've got those targets A, B, C, D, E. And now you're wondering, you know, what, what would be the most likely um, drug target uh, for my new compound? And using label propagation, you can kind of guess uh, what, are, what is the most likely target. You can even rank the target, so it becomes a little bit of a program very similar to ImageNet and Deep Learning, where you, you're allowed to give five predictions, and the right prediction should be part of those. So as you can imagine, we can do cross-validation and pretend we don't know about that drug, even so we know the target, and, and then test whether the predictions are correct. And our first result is that it basically sucks as hell. Uh, we got only 60% or 66% uh, of accuracy, which is not very good. So we decided to, to, to uh, understand a little bit more why this is so bad. Um, and we went back to our best data set, which is CTRPB2, where they basically very well annotated the drug targets. Because even the drug targets, actually, it's a, it's a kind of annotation that's hard to get. Different databases will give you very different results. So we decided to go back to that data set where they did a, a very deep uh, manual operation of the drug target and see whether we could do better. Of course, the number of drugs is going to decrease. And here you get very, you get much more reasonable uh, accuracy. So it's not perfect yet, but there is a signal. So obviously, we need to do, to do a better job at annotating the targets of those drugs. And, and if you look at the neighbors, we look only at the five uh, closest neighbors, nearest neighbors, and you can see that on average, we actually predict much more targets. Than, than expected. I was expecting maybe one or two targets. It gives a lot of heterogeneity. Many drugs are predictable targets. Yeah? So when you predict drug targets, do you consider um, inhibitors or activators? Is that That's a good question. So I would say the vast majority of the drugs we have are, are inhibitors. Yeah. Um, but we should look at this in detail. I, I honestly don't think we have only a very small, only a very small portion proportion of activators, but that's that's a good point. We should definitely discriminate the two counts. Yeah. Is this really so bad if the prior probability of picking the right target is so low? Because like if you just guess randomly you have a very small chance of sixty one percent it's a huge improvement, really. Yeah, so the when we saw the first results we, we wanted to give up. Right? But then we we tried to understand what could go wrong. And because some drugs had so many targets, and we knew that we were collecting many data from, we were collecting those annotations from multiple databases, databases, and what we saw actually is that those databases disagree, which is extremely annoying. If you try to create something that nobody really agree upon, um, but CTOPV2, what the Broad Institute did was really like a very deep manual creation of the drug targets, and instead of having multiple targets for, for drugs, they usually focus on one or two. So it just makes the problem much cleaner. And that's just an indication that something you could do is just that we we'll probably have many dirty annotations. But we, so it's not clear how to clean those annotations, right? So we're a little bit stuck on that side, but you're right, 66% is probably too close to run down for you. Well, is it random because like what's the chance to predict a drug target? Because like there's so many. Yeah, yeah no, I, see, I see what you mean. Maybe the random case would be 30%, right? Um, uh, I, we need to do some permutation to see, you know, how far from the random guess we are. Um, yeah, that's a, that's a good point. Still too close for me. Uh, too too low for me. But I'm going to make the opposite point. It's actually very good. Yeah. <laughs> not for people. Not for people reviewing your paper. <laughs> but if you want to review my paper, you can. <laughs> okay. So, um, yeah. Still. It, this is a new application, right? We, we try to predict drug targets. Um, we are moderately su successful if we limit to the high quality data, part of the data. And so we wanted to see what are the, what is the, the, the layer that's really most predictive. So if you, if you build that network with only perturbation structure sensitivity, you can see that sensitivity is doing a very good job. So this phenotypic readout is actually very informative to understand what the drug is doing. And, and, and I guess that only works when you have a pretty decent uh, panel science because you need that molecular heterogeneity and, and understand that relationship. So I think, uh, I think that, that was kind of interesting. And the Fuse network is doing better, but probably not as much as we would like. But still, still uh, it's basically a no-brainer. You, you don't do worse than any single data layer, so why not having multiple data layers? But if you want to decrease your, the cost of your experiment, you could probably 
uh, for get perturbation and just take structure and, and some sensitivity you probably do as well. And the, the problem as well is that even because we don't have drug annotation for all the targets, uh, sorry, target annotation for all the drugs, what happens is that sometimes the five closest neighbors um, have very little target. So we have to expand a little bit the search when we look for labels. And further you go, more likely you are uh, to make a mistake. And that's basically, on the x-axis, it's kind of the distance from the network. So if, you're, if it's one, it means that you're like the closest neighbor, so you, you make little mistakes. But if you, have, if you have to go further away to finally find a label, it actually means that this drug is in a part of the network that has been poorly characterized in the past. And that's where you are, your, your prediction really get bad. So there's also, I'm pretty sure that there are class of compounds where we do very, very well, and, a, and another, other classes of compounds where we do very poorly just because we don't have the supervised labels to really work with. So at the end of the day, um, we try to develop a method that's convenient for biologists to understand what an uh, uh, uncharacterized compound is doing. And because we don't use stuff like toxicity or ATC classification, you don't really need that drug to go as far as the clinic to understand what it's doing. It's supposed to be very early on in the drug development process. Um, many many methods actually using toxicity to classify drugs, but toxicity means that you ever tested on animals or even humans already, and that's that's way too dumb, too far in the process. We want it to be very uh, early. So there is uh, a bit of a prototype of a web app to explore the network, but we didn't implement most of the stuff we wanted to do, including uh, the, the interactive target uh, predictions. So. Uh, I was saying 2018 last year, um, or probably 2019, but let's be optimistic. Uh, I would like to thank uh, people in the lab, uh, especially uh, Alex and me and Dina and, and Lade for um, all the DNF to drug for fusion work, um, and um, Jale, Peter, and, and a lot of people um, working on PharmacoGX and, and PharmacoDP in the lab and, and my collaborators. And I would like to say that this is all open source. So if you're a research parasite or data virtual or data vampire, it all works out. You can <laughs> use the data, uh, you can criticize, you can set a mean message, say, hey, it doesn't work, that's fine, we're just going to work with you to fix it. Um, and we really care about the quality of our tools. So we don't pretend that we got the annotation right or we got the processing right. So really, if you find something wrong, first, we're happy if you use it, if you find something wrong. Go on the GitHub page, uh, open a ticket, and and, uh, and be as mean as possible, but provide code and examples so we can. <laughs> and I don't know if I have. Uh, that's so much. Anyway, uh, 